This is Mr. Montgomery, and today I'm going to be talking about chapter one in our textbook from In Mixed Company, and the primary focus is going to be on communication competence in groups. Now, as you, in this chapter, we're going to be covering uh, misunderstandings or misconceptions about uh, the human communication process, what communication is and what communication is not, what constitutes this term uh, communication competence or competent communication, and then ways to discover and uh, practice communication competence. So in this chapter, myths about communication, communication defined, so we know what we're talking about, communication competence defined, uh, achieving communication competence, and then also talking about what is it when we talk about a group, what is it that we are uh, talking about? So most of us, probably all of us, have been involved in a group experience of some sort. And I'm trying right now to figure out which camera I'm on because I have two screens. Hopefully this is the right one. Anyway, we'll find out. Uh, so we've all been in groups, but have your experiences in groups been positive or negative? And the textbook points out that a lot of people say their experiences in groups have been uh, negative. Well, I've been in groups for many years, many varieties of different kinds of groups. And in fact, the textbook lists out these groups, primary groups with family and friends. We usually think of it as dinner, getting together, celebrating the holidays, something like that. But there's something that happens within families and close friends that gather together. Uh, even this uh, coronavirus these days has made even gathering together more challenging. Uh, we tend to meet outside in our backyard by the pool rather than in the house to have more space and freedom, even with our loved uh, kids and uh, spouses and all that. Uh, there are social media networks. We're all probably involved in a Facebook group or um, Instagram. I don't know if that has groups. I have a Instagram account, but I never use it. I've gotten as far as Facebook, but that's about about it. Uh, we have project groups. I've done many house building projects over the years. Uh, learning groups. I've been in studies uh, many, many, many times. Have led studies. Have written studies. Have been involved in studies. Lots of uh, learning groups. Activities groups. From you know softball, church league. Uh, to other things like that. Neighborhood groups. My wife uh, is connected with a lot of our neighbors through, they just have a connection where if they see something, they'll text everybody else. Like we had a bear on our street a few weeks ago and we've had a bobcat and we've actually had um, um, peacocks on our street and raccoons and rabbits and everything else around here. Right now, I'm dealing with rats up the hillside. So lots of activity groups, neighborhood groups. Uh, social groups, groups that you get together to do something socially. Service groups where your group has a purpose to help and make things better. And then music and artistic groups are some of the ones that they list in the textbook. So how many of those have you been involved with? How many have been good experiences? How many have bad experiences? Are you uh, hesitating to join a group because of past bad experiences. Uh, and then there's one more that they mention, and that is virtual groups. Now, virtual groups are different in at least one aspect, that you may never see the people in that group face to face. You're just, you know, back in the day when I was young, and I never really did, but pen pals, that's when people wrote people, maybe they never met them face to face, but they wrote letters back and forth across the uh, country, around the world, but that was the old way of a virtual group of at least two. Uh, but today it's through social media. People are in groups and they talk with people and they know people pretty well. Maybe they even are uh, dating online. Is that a thing? I guess it is. Uh, but uh, they, they never see each other face to face. Well, the purpose of the textbook, the author tells us, is they want to improve your ability to communicate within a small group context. Now we have this vast field of communication studies and maybe you've taken one or two or three courses 
maybe a public speaking course, maybe one on interpersonal communication, uh, maybe one on communication, uh, kind of an overview. But this one says, we are looking at communication from a small group perspective. How do we communicate in small groups? And what is unique about that experience? And we are trying to improve our communication to achieve a higher level of what uh, they are calling communication competence, that we're learning to be more effective, more productive, more satisfying, more uh, getting things done through quality communication, and in our context, through quality communication in small groups. Now, the author makes a very interesting statement on page three. This is a paraphrase, but the author says we tend to overestimate our communication proficiency in groups. That is, we think we are better communicators than we are in groups. I think I'm a great communicator in groups, but am I? And how do you feel about that statement? Are you a good communicator? Do you consider yourself a good communicator? If you asked other people in the group, would they go, oh, you know, and roll, roll their eyes? Or would they say, oh, yeah, he or she is a really good communicator. But the reality is we all have room for improvement no matter where we are at with our small groups. So let's talk about four different myths of small groups, things that we think are true, um, but communicate not, not just in small groups, but overall. Number one, communication is a cure-all. That is, if I'm a good communicator, I can overcome any problem. Now, I think I'm a good communicator. I honestly do. And objectively, I, I just think I am trying to be objective. But communication doesn't solve all problems. There might be personal problems. There might be relational problems. There might be uh, a problem with the other person that they are going through, physiological problems. And communication isn't going to solve everything. It can go a long ways, but it can't solve everything. Second, communication can break down. Even in a good communication, a uh, word said at the wrong time in the wrong way, or when a person is going through a certain situation in life, the communication may become less. It may become broken down. Somebody may be a little more acute to how other people are communicating with them, and things can go sideways. Even if you have good communication today, that's no guarantee for uh, tomorrow. Third, effective communication is, in, is merely skill building, that if I can learn how to be an effective communicator. Uh, I can do so by learning a certain set of skills. Now, when I, I've done a lot of counseling over the years, but when I do that, I will sit straight eye to eye with a person. I will lean forward. I will nod my head to communicate that I am listening and paying attention to them. But just because I have those skills, I might be thinking, did I leave the iron on? Uh, I wonder what the Chiefs are doing uh, in their game today. Just because we have skills doesn't necessarily mean we are an effective communicator. It's more than just skills. Uh, and for effective communication is just common sense. That if I just do what comes naturally, if I just do what seems right, I will be a cum good communicator. It, that is just wrong because what is common sense to you may not be common sense to me, and vice versa. So just because it's common sense to me doesn't mean it's helpful in my uh, communication methods. So what is communication? Well, one of the key elements they talk, communication overall is me communicate, sending a message to you that has meaning and significance. And are you sending a message to me? But one of the elements they want to point out in this uh, chapter is communication is transactional. That means communication goes back and forth. In the past, the traditional model of communication was what would be called linear. That is, basically, it would be discussed as I have a message in my mind that I put into words or some kind of vehicle. Maybe I write it. Maybe I speak it. Maybe I send it telepathically, whatever. Uh, but I send a message to you. I am the sender. You are the receiver. You receive that message. You 
translate it, download it, understand it, and then nod your head in agreement. But over the years, as communication studies has matured, uh, we see that there is a lot more to it than that. And so we now talk about a transactional model of communication where we understand that it's not just one person communicating to another, but the other one, even while you're communicating to someone else, they are communicating back to you, for example, through nonverbal feedback. They are rolling their eyes. They are nodding their head. They are checking their watch. They are uh, not paying attention, watching the, the game over your shoulder. All these messages are saying something to us, and so both are involved in this transactional give and take process of communication. Now, the author uh, shares uh, some different dimensions of communication. For example, they talk about the context, content dimension. And the content dimension is basically the content that is being shared. That's one dimension. Another dimension to consider is the relationship dimension. And the textbook uh, provides this dialogue as well. And when you read the, communica the communication uh, transcript here, you'll see that it's not just about the information or the content. It's also about how the two are relating to each other, how they are getting along, how they are not getting along. Uh, let me read just one sentence. Um, and of course, I'm going to add the, the uh, style well, why don't you come up with a time that works for your busy schedule? So the sarcasm is there with that word busy, and that's reflecting a lot more than just data or information. It's saying somebody is upset in this relationship where they are trying to communicate with one another. So there's that dimension. Now, another thing I want to point out here, and it might be a little bit of overlap, but we all understand language can be ambiguous, right? In fact, they give the example here, Beware of children. So is that a message that says children are out to get you? Or is it, hey, you who are driving, drive carefully because there are children here. So be aware that children are here in this area and you want to be very careful for our precious cargo, right, as they say. So language can be ambiguous. And the reason it's ambiguous is because language is this symbolic. In other words, when you look at a cat or you look at a dog, I'm more of a dog person, uh, there's nothing about the word cat, C-A-T, or dog, D-O-G, that in itself is inherently communicating that four-legged animal that is tricky and deceiving, the cat, versus loyal and loving, the dog. There's nothing that, in those words that, that say automatically that until we learn that to make that connection in our mind. And we have assigned meanings to different verbal sounds, right? Cat means that one, and dog means that one. An example I give is, you are cool. So when I say you are cool, it could mean probably at least two things that I can think of. Either you're really hip and with it and, and know what's going on. I like that. I want to be like that. Or you are cool in the sense of you are standing in a walk-in freezer and you've been there a while, so I know that you are cool because your you know, teeth are chattering and there's icicles hanging off your nose. You are cool. Then another aspect that we want to look at is that social media has led to a greater challenge for communication, particularly in the area of international communication, because now we have uh, languages and cultures that are different that lead to more ambiguity and possible confusion or misunderstanding. Uh, so, and especially in the area, of, for example, of nonverbal communication. You see, when I'm sitting face to face, I can not only listen to your words, but I can also see your expressions, what you're doing with your hands, if your face is excited or kind of turned down, you're sad. I can read all those nonverbal signals that add to my interpretation and understanding of what you are saying. But in nonverbal communication, we are kind of, uh, our, our communication is kind of 
stripped of all those extras. I'll give you an example. I'm a stamp collector and I was ordering some stamps from China and it was through email and I was saying I would like to get these stamps somehow either in what I was communicating through tech through typing and or what they were hearing the person I wanted to buy the stamps from was getting rather angry and irritated and thought I was being rude and inappropriate I just wanted to buy stamps at a good price and something was going sideways and it was in the uh, misunderstanding because we did not have those additional cues of verbal and visual. All we had were the uh, typed messages. So things go sideways. And as we said before, nonverbal communication can be ambiguous. We just don't have those extras to help us interpret correctly. Uh, then another dimension is the cultural dimension. That, that because cultures are different worldwide, how we understand communications, how we say and communicate with others can lead to all sorts of challenges and misunderstandings. Now, one of the aspects of cultural differences that affect our communication is what we call individualism versus collectivism in a particular culture. And this, this picture is in your textbook. It has all the different countries, and they talk about how some cultures, often related to uh, countries, they can, you can have cultures within cultures within cultures, uh, but some nations are more individualistic oriented, and some are more collect collectivist oriented. And you'll see the orange is more highly individualist, and the uh, bluish green is highly collective. You will notice that the United States is highly individualistic in our orientation, and that affects how we communicate. Do we communicate more or less? Do we uh, keep it bare bones communication, or do we, you know, stuff in extra words, extra descriptions, extras, extras, extras? Is there more passion or less passion? in our uh, communication based on this individualistic versus collectivist cultures. So they have a quiz in the book. I, I left it in here so you can see it, but you can take this on your own. But uh, are you more individualist or collectivist? Now for me, I am very much individualist. I would fit in really well with that previous uh, national, international law. Uh, diagram is I'm very much an individualist uh, the way I live and think and approach life. Uh, and so here I tend to be direct and forthright. I enjoy being unique and different. I like my privacy. And just as a hint, the odd numbered questions are, spoiler alert, are individualist and the even numbers are collectivist. Uh, please my family, sacrifice my self-interest for the benefit of my group. Uh, children should be taught to place duty before pleasure. And so you can see those kinds of questions. So you can take that and uh, add that up. All that. Okay, so another aspect of small group discussion in this chapter is groups versus aggregations, defining small groups. Uh, and two words that I would use are just as a general concept here, groups tend to be, um, oh, I misspelled the word there. The first one, groups are intentional, aggregations are incidental. In other words, just because people gather together in the same area at the same time does not make it a group by the textbook and general definition. And they give examples. A group a crack at a, at a, a group gathered together at a baseball game doing the wave, a crowd in a shopping mall. Just because people are there, the crowd, you see, they have an intentional strategy of all joining in to create the wave around the uh, outfield in, in the stands. Cheerleading squad performing. They are there working together. They have a common goal. They, they all want to... Uh, do a great job. They all want to win in a competition. 
They've all practiced together. They've spent time together uh, versus individuals waiting for cheerleading tryouts. These are folks who are not on a team. They're in it just to get a place for themselves. They're not thinking about if I do A, that's going to affect everybody else. They're just there for themselves to get on the squad. Crossing guard, leading children. They all have a goal to get across the street safely. The, the leader has a job to oversee that process. But when children are waiting at a stop signal uh, to cross the street or waiting at a uh, bus stop in the morning to catch the bus to school, they're just there, maybe a little more at the school, but they don't really have a shared strategy and goal, at least not at the stop signal. They're just, you know, they all want to cross the street, but they're going to do their own thing. Some are going to move quickly. Some are not. Some might be looking at their phones. Some are not. Some might be accompanied with their parents. Some are not. But there's no kind of cohesion holding them together. And then finally, a jury deliberating. A jury deliberating says they've been assigned to a case. They're all responsible to be there. They have to be there. They've been listening to the case presented. They're now gathering together. They're discussing the testimony and what they've heard. They're going to come to a group decision together. All that common, those elements, but individuals waiting for jury duty, they may have all been called, but they may not be assigned to a case. They have not yet had any real experiences together except being in a room. So you see that they point out all these differences between what makes a group versus an aggregate or just a incidental haphazard gathering of individuals. Then they have a picture here, and you look at the group and you so answer the questions. So, and this is also helped by the textbook. Uh, a group would be defined by three or more individuals. So are there three individuals here? Yes. Uh, interacting for the achievement of some common goal? Well, we don't know. Because they're all at the airport. Some may be arriving. Some may be travelers. Some may be waiting for uh, their family members or friends to arrive or they just departed. Or maybe they just like to go hang around airports. So we don't know. Probably not. Uh, they don't have a common goal. And then individuals influence each other in the attainment of joint goals. No, because we don't know what the goals are. And like I said, there are probably more individuals. Maybe the group sitting is a family, but you have people going. Well, there's there, nobody's going the opposite way. If those who are standing, we can see them moving. They're all going from from my view, from left to right, uh, they're all there at the same time of day. But I couldn't say that this is a group by definition. Can't tell. Okay, now we want to talk about communication competence. And we talked about that at the beginning, that we are trying to become more competent in our communication. And the textbook says there's two kind of... Uh, aspects to consider uh, effectiveness and appropriateness, and we need to take into account the context where it is. So under effectiveness, we, we are after goal achievement. We want to do something. We're trying to accomplish something in an effective manner. And we all know that we're all at different levels of effectiveness in our communication competence. Some of us are great communicators. Some of us not so much. So there's a continuum there. And then also to be effective in communication, we also have to have a we, not me orientation. That is, I need to be thinking beyond myself and consider the desires, goals, aspirations of the group. Doesn't mean I, don't, I, I give up on my personal goals, but it does say I need to take both into account. And that appropriateness in communication uh, leads to communication competence, and that is to recognize that there are rules when it comes to appropriate communication. Again, these rules are often guided by context. So following rules uh, is appropriate if we kind of all know. You know, when you're a kid, nobody sits down with you. Maybe your parents do here and there, but nobody sits down at three years old and says, okay, so we are going to spend the next four hours teaching you how to communicate. We kind of more pick it up as we go. So it's just kind of uh, caught rather than taught. And just to give three aspects that uh, we need one to consider. First of all, you follow the rules. 
there are rules in communication. We don't talk when other people are talking. We don't interrupt others. We listen quietly and politely. We don't even interrupt minimally through. Um, we speak loud enough for others to hear. We face people when we're communicating. Lots of sorts of rules out there. Rules might be a little bit strong, but you get the idea. We call it etiquette also, communication etiquette. Uh, another aspect is we know that when we break rules, they have consequences. If you constantly interrupt people when they're speaking, constantly, 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 as person after person after person, you'll find that less people want to talk to you. The consequence of, of continually interruptions is less people communicate with you. So rules have consequences. If you offend people all the time, they will defriend you on Facebook and those kinds of things. But then also, we also know that rules over time can and should be changed uh, when it comes to different communication styles. And I'm learning that with, uh, I'll give you an example. Now, I still tend to prefer to be called Mr. Montgomery. I'm not greatly offended if somebody calls me by my first name, but I think there's something to be said with uh, respect and honor of position. I call people sir uh, or ma'am. Um, it's just what I do. But does that need to change? Maybe. So something to consider. Oop, wrong way. And then they also talk about five different ways to improve your com communication comments. Five areas where you want to be strong and get better. Number one is knowledge. Know the rules. Understand the rules. Second, skill. Apply those that knowledge and apply those rules effectively. Third, sensitivity. Be sensitive and aware and conscientious of what's happening around you. If somebody's not paying attention, it might be because I, you're, I'm boring, but it also might be because they have things going on. Do I need to stop talking because they need to get going? Uh, number four, commitment. Am I always willing to strive for excellence and improvement in my communication. I try to learn and grow uh, over time. And then finally, ethics, that there are ways we treat each other that are in terms of right and wrong and appropriate and inappropriate, practicing honesty, respecting others, being fair to others. Uh, don't force people to, you know, in communication to have to listen to you, uh, coercion, and then be responsible in your communication. If you're going to say it, Stand up for it and hold firm, but also be willing to be, if, it, if you're wrong and it's pointed out to you that you're wrong, then apologize, ask forgiveness, move on. Okay, so that is this chapter. We've talked about misconceptions. We have explained what communication is and isn't. We've looked at what constitutes competent communication. Um, we've discussed general ways to achieve communication competence. And we've also talked a little, little bit about what defines groups versus aggregates, groups that come together for intentional purposes versus those that just happen to be in the same place at the same time, incidentally. All right. So I think that will do it. Thank you.